Oh, well. So this is my greatest honor to introduce Dr. Liu Zhonglen to kick off this lecture series. Dr. Liu is an associate professor of sociology at National Taiwan University. He's also affiliated with the with the NTU's international degree on climate change and sustainable development. Dr. Liu's research draws from economic and environmental sociology to study climate change and the environment. His dissertation research analyzed the global carbon market through the lens of materiality, framing, and citizen participation. Dr. Liu has interdisciplinary background with trainings in sociology, resource management, economics, and engineering. Integrating this diverse background, he has branched out his recent research interests into topics of race, gender, and food in society with a very broad geographic reach. So today, Dr. Liu will speak about understanding politics of climate change in Taiwan from global, national, to local. Let's welcome Dr. Zhonglen Liu. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here to talk, uh, to be to join the lecture series organized by UW. And I was on the UW campus a couple of years ago to attend the National uh, North American Taiwan Study Associations Conference. I have fond memories in Seattle, and it's nice to be back virtually to uh, to join the program. And today. Today, I'm, I'm, uh, my goal is to give audience a general introduction of the on the politics of climate change in Taiwan. And this is based on the review article in the making. And I will proceed. This is the outline of my talk. To understand the politics of climate change, I will first uh, proceed with some basic information on Taiwan's emission profiles. And these are the critical background to understand the broader picture. And after that, I will go through three different sections. First, I'll focus on the macro, the global part, on how Taiwan's unique international status shapes its climate actions. Then I'll go into some of the national politics and how Taiwan's developmentalism legacy constrain its national uh, energy choices. Finally, I'll offer some local view on how Taiwan thriving civil society facilitates some local responses. And these are not mutually exclusive uh, categories as they often intertwine with each other, but I, but I found it a useful uh, uh, way to orient uh, our thinking on this topic. And then I'll conclude. And first, as an intro, Although many people are already aware of uh, the situation, I want to stress that Taiwan uh, is very vulnerable to climate change and is already feeling the impact. On various uh, climate vulnerability index, Taiwan ranked very high on these rankings. And as an island country, sea level rise obviously threats the, uh, threatens the coast. This is a, a prediction of the sea level rise that could happen, potentially happen in Taipei and New Taipei. You can see much of the low-lying area will be threatened. And the climate impact does not limit it to uh, sea level rise only. Uh, for example, it is also a public health crisis when dengue fevers, which is a public health, uh, which is a serious problem in Taiwan summer, for now, is mostly constrained in, in, in the south, but with the rising temperature, you will, it's predicted to be th uh, spreading to, to the northern part of the country as well. And finally, uh, this is my favorite example on how climate change can hit Taiwan in some of the ways that people didn't even, even foresee. And as you see on the slides, I have lychees, and two years ago, because of the warm winter, the lychee trees didn't flower at all. So in one in that year, the yield of lychee fruits dropped uh, more than 80% in that year. And obviously the far lychee farmers were hit very hard, as well as the bee farmers, beekeepers that depend on these trees. So all in all, climate change is posing great threats and is already impacting Taiwan. 
and it is of great importance uh, that we treat it as an emergency uh, to take action. And so now let's move on to Taiwan's emission profile. And first I will show you the trend of the emission in Taiwan. And I want to highlight there are four characteristics of uh, emissions in Taiwan. First, uh, Taiwan's emission have significant contribution from the industrial sector. Second, uh, Taiwan's emission, many of them come from what we call the hard to abase sectors. And third, Taiwan's emission is very much driven by its export economy. And finally, Taiwan's emission structure is highly concentrated on a few big players that to the extent we can call it as a carbon oligopoly. And finally, I will go through some of the policy developments in this section. First, this is a table of uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, trends since the uh, uh, 1990s. In the year 1990s, the greenhouse gas emission was about 109 million tons per year. And by 2019, it's around uh, 200, 258. And during this period, you can see the tremendous growth in the blue, uh, in the blue section, that is uh, energy use. It increased almost four times. And after the year 2005, you can see the emission is roughly plateaued and it's, the growth has been slowed, but we are on a challenge a uh, great challenge to reduce this trend and plateau is obviously not enough to address climate change. I also want to put this in a global perspective. This emission is about roughly about 1% of the global total. It does not sound high, but given the population size of Taiwan, the per capita emission in Taiwan is very high. It's higher than most of the European countries. So Taiwan as a, a developed country has the moral responsibility and has uh, had to take actions. Okay, so now let's break the emission profile into different sectors. So here I'm showing you the direct emissions and the direct and indirect emissions. So on the right hand, the bar on the right hand side, this is when we allocate energy to its final users. And here you can see a, a big orange section that accounts for about half of Taiwan's total emission. This is my first point that Taiwan's emission mostly come from the industry, industrial sector, and this is much higher than the global average. And within this industry sector, uh, within this orange section, most of them come from uh, steel, cement, and petrochemical companies. And these are sectors that it is really hard to abate, hard to uh, mitigate. And therefore, Taiwan faces a greater challenge than most other countries, given its emission character. And many of the industries also are export-oriented, so min uh, that very much Taiwan's emission also correlates with its situation in the global trade. Okay, now I'm showing, and as I said, another character of Taiwan's emission, it is, that is that the emission is highly concentrated on a few main actors. Here I'm showing you the top 10 emitters in Taiwan calculated in million tons. And on the left, number one is Formosa Petrochemical Corporations, or Taiso. And you can see other bars with a similar uh, color. Uh, there are four of them. These are all the subsidiaries under Formosa Plastic. And in total, the four Taiso subsidiary accounts for about 19% of Taiwan's total emission. That is... Uh, a very high number. 
And also the number two and number three on this table, that is China Steel and Dragon Steel. These are Zhonggang. Zhonggang is another big player in the room. And these two combined, they account for about 11% of Taiwan's total emission. So in, in, in other words, Taisu and Zhonggang combined together accounts for about 30% of Taiwan's uh, total emission. And this highly concentrated uh, structure have political implications on uh, these big actors has to, uh, is critical in Taiwan's uh, uh, overall emission reduction effort. Okay, so to reduce Taiwan's emission, uh, the most important task is to decarbonize Taiwan's energy mix. Here I'm showing you a load curve from yesterday. These are, this is a, a table showing you the different source of generation, uh, electricity generation from yesterday during noon. You can see that if you read Chinese, most of the source comes from coal and gas. They account together about 60, 30, uh, 60, 70 percent. We have about 13 percent of nuclear. And you can see in the middle of the day, uh, solar and wind is already making an impact. Solar accounts for about 10 percent around noontime uh, yes, uh, in yesterday. And the, the goal is to, and for Taiwan's mitigation effort, the goal is to take out the carbon from this energy mix to replace that with renewables. And here I'm showing you a policy target, right? So on the left, uh, there are two pie charts on these slides. On the left-hand side, we can see this is a uh, energy mix in 2019. As I said, energy, uh, natural gas and coal, fossil fuels dominates our Taiwan's energy mix. And at this point, the Thai administration is taking a multi-prone approach to decarbonize Taiwan's energy use. First, we are phasing out nuclear. That's roughly 12% at this point. We're phasing out nuclear. At the same time, we're decreasing coal, which is very polluting and high carbon emission and replace coal to a certain extent with natural gas. And on the other hand, we are doing a rapid expansion on renewables from uh, the policy target is to reduce uh, to increase from roughly 60, uh, 6 percent at this point to about 20 percent by 2025. It is uh, quite a challenge and we are tracking very closely how much we are making the target. And with that, that is the first step in Taiwan's long-term energy uh, transition. Here on this slide, I'm showing you an emission reduction path uh, proposed by the GHG Reduction and Management Act, Wen uh, Guanfan. That is uh, the act governing Taiwan's uh, emission reduction efforts. And here you see we are at 2021 now. The goal is to reduce 10% of the emission by 2025 to 20% uh, by 2030 and to 50% by 2050. The, from the graph, if you are not a climate policy uh, expert, you might see this as quite an ambitious goal given the, the trajectory. But globally, Taiwan's effort has not been uh, the most ambitious. Recently, we have seen many neighboring countries both Japan and South Korea is setting up a 2050 net zero target. Also, China proposed its net, uh, net zero target by 2060. So in the past few months, there has been a lot of discussion on how much Taiwan should increase its ambition in emission reduction and to the extent we might follow suit and to start up a 2050 net zero target as well. 
Okay, so that is a long introduction of Taiwan's emission background. You can see that it's dominated by industrial sector and uh, and we have daunting challenges lying ahead. And as for now, I'm shifting gear to talk about the politics on all of these. And first I will start with the global view. And the first thing to understand Taiwan's climate action to me is to, uh, to understand how much that connects to Taiwan's pursuit or struggles in the international space. Uh, so first, uh, here I'm giving a few bullet points. Uh, climate action connects to international space and external pressure also leads to some domestic gesture policy. And because Taiwan has been constrained, rather constrained uh, in the official channels, the government has adopted a polycentric strategy to strive for space in many different areas. And finally, we are seeing increased influence from the supply chain. And the first thing to understand about uh, international space is that Taiwan, because it's not a member of the United Nation, it has been left out from the global uh, climate negotiation process that is governed by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or known as the UNFCCC. As you see, here is an op-ed that arguing Taiwan should be part of the global fight against climate change. And this is similar to Taiwan's struggle in other areas, similar to the WHO in ICAO. And both the KNT government and DPP government has been trying to open up space in these areas. And on this front, now everyone is familiar with the slogan, Taiwan can help. And this is also the same campaign that Taiwan should be part of the global community. Here is a photo that you can see in uh, one of the climate summits. When, you, uh, when diplomats from all over the world attend this conference, they can see uh, government sponsor ads like these try to make the case Taiwan shouldn't be left out. This is another example that Taiwan can help to combat climate change. But such action has only yield limited uh, progress. And this, is, uh, this slide shows a, a recent news uh, from, uh, not recent news, from 2016, that Taiwan has been um, blocked by, by the Chinese government to attend the UN climate summit. And I want to stress that this happens in the UN framework, the U UN subsidiaries, but also in international organizations such as the World Bank or the International Energy Agency. And such exclusion not the impact is not limited to Taiwan's uh, sovereign status. Also, it creates certain knowledge gap in the climate policy circle that Taiwan had to make extra effort to ob obtain the relevant information to stay on track on the global uh, effort on, to deal with climate change. Uh, given the difficulty Taiwan have in the uh, UN process, Taiwan, Taiwan's government has adopted a, a polycentric strategy, try to use NG such, uh, entities such as NGOs, such as local governments, such as academics, to expand its international space in terms of climate change. The, one of the example is uh, ICDF, or known as Guo Hui, the International Cooperation and Development Fund. This is a foreign aid agency of Taiwanese government, and climate change has been one of their uh, uh, main areas of work. For example, on this slide, you can see that they uh, they help 
the island country St. Kitts and Nevis, Taiwan's diplomatic ally, to adapt with climate change. And also, Taiwan has been making effort to participate globally through uh, subnational entities, such as cities. For, for example, this is a sustainability system, sustainable city forum uh, organized by Taoyuan's government, and it is under the initiative of ICLI, that is known as Local Government for Sustainabilities. But unfortunately, even a city level uh, effort can often be pushed back uh, by the, or limited by Chinese government. Another incident break, broke out last year that some of the city are listed in uh, as in China and has been some uproar and it changed back to Chinese Taipei, etc. But but these are the one of the polycentric efforts by the Taiwanese government to participate more broadly. And besides the government, now we have seen tremendous growth in uh, corporate environmental actions on climate change. And Taiwan as the hub for uh, electronic industries and a key player in the global supply chain has also been increasing its effort. For example, here, here are the five companies that have participated in RE100, that is uh, companies committed to using 100% renewable energies. And most, most significantly, the TSMC, Taiji Dian, have made a, mon a very important commitment last year and has also made the world's largest purchase of green energy uh, as part of their effort. And much of this effort has been driven by the supply chain. Taiwan uh, embedded deeply in the global tech supply chain is also influenced by some of the major players in the field. For example, Apple, the company Apple have announced a target of going carbon neutral by 2030. And the suppliers in Taiwan has to respond to that goal. Besides the TSMC I just mentioned, the company Foxconn, Honghai, has also uh, responded with an, its own carbon neutral pledge. So we, these are uh, some of the new development. It has been ongoing and changing very rapidly. rapidly. And we have, but the good news is that we, are, we have been seeing momentum that we have not seen in, uh, in the past years. So overall, that is uh, how the on, the, on the global side, how Taiwan's climate action has been shaped by uh, the UN politics as well as supply chains. Now I'm moving on to the national part. And here I am going to talk about a few main points. First, I'm going to highlight the dominance of nuclear power debate in Taiwan's policy discussion, going to show you a few cases of the pushback from high carbon incumbents. I'm also going to talk about the legacy of developmental state and how that shapes Taiwan's emission profile and policy. And finally, how the fragmented governance structure constrain Taiwan's climate effort. So on the nuclear power, so for any of you that follows Taiwan's politics, you will know this is the single most environmental issues in Taiwan. And Taiwan now has three nuclear reactors and the nuclear four, or known as He Si, has been uh, hotly debated in uh, more than 20 years. And my colleagues, He Ming Xiu in my department has written extensively on this topic. And to summarize, I mean, the, the anti-nuclear protest trace its roots uh, in Taiwan's democracy movement. So back then there was a, the slogan is, uh, anti-nuclear is anti-authoritarian, fan he zhi fan du cai. So back then the anti-nuclear anti -nuclear movement connects deeply with Taiwan's pursuits. Into, uh, in democracy. 
but um, since the year 2000, there has been a few back and forth on the nuclear fuel policy, and in in Tsai Ing-wen's administration, the policy goal is to phase out nuclear entirely. And so we are on track to, to achieve this goal, but overall, this is still uh, the most hotly debated topic. The, anti the nuclear debate also have certain international linkage. Uh, my colleague He Ming Xiu has written that Taiwan has seen a Fukushima effect. That's the Taiwan, uh, the anti-nuclear demonstration gets a, a big boost after the new Fukushima incident. And uh, the dominance of nuclear power in discussion, uh, in my view, very often I distract the, the larger discussion on energy transition. Nuclear power only accounts for rough, a little more than 10% of Taiwan's energy mix. So without nuclear or not, uh, the fossil fuel should be the elephant in the room. But unfortunately, the fixation on nuclear power has to a certain extent distract the debate. And in recent years, we have also seen a, a pushback by the pro-nuclear side and this is a campaign, uh, it's known as Yi He Yang Lu or Nuclear for Green. They have been very successful in organizing uh, support. He has also appropriated some of the social movement tactics um, to the extent it uh, successfully hosted a referendum two years ago and is hosting another new uh, referendum asking to reactivate uh, nuclear power plant four, number four uh, in this summer. So again, nuclear power is the, the one issue in Taiwan's energy debate, but it shouldn't be, it should be, in my view, it should be a much broader uh, discussion. And the pushback of the existing high carbon regime also come from actors such as, uh, in this case, uh, manufacturers of fossil fuel scooters, right? This is a campaign as known as the Yodian Pingquan, or I translated that as equality between mobilities. And again, this is a case of the high carbon incumbents, appropriate some of the social movement language to, to, to frame the subsidies for the electric, uh, electric, electric scooters as unfair, and they have they have been quite successfully even lobby for subsidies for themselves for the fossil fuel vehicles, and but this is just showing in the process of energy transition uh, there will be winners and losers, and the current high carbon players has been. Uh, to, not to people's surprise, they have been pushing back some of the effort we have, we have been seeing. <clears throat> in addition, Taiwan's high carbon industry should be understand as a product of the industry uh, industrial policy in the developmental state era. Many of the heavy industries such as steel, cement, petrochemical, these are he uh, heavily supported by Taiwanese states in, uh, from since the 70s. And many people have argued that these uh, big players has been locked in a brown economy that is relying on high carbon, uh, high emission uh, business models. And they tend to be rather passive um, and even to extend, even hinder some of the climate actions uh, we strive to achieve. Uh, for example, they have been uh, pushing back uh, on the reform on the energy price and oil price, right? Here is a table I'm showing you the comparison of electricity price around the world. You can see that Taiwan rank uh, the fourth lowest among some of the major countries. 
And this is in the background that Taiwan does not have almost, Taiwan does not have, have almost have no domestic energy sources. And almost the all energy has to be, to be imported. And the low electricity price is a product of heavy subsidies from the government. In the transition to a green economy, um, this can be a, a barriers that needs to be overcome as well. And finally, in the energy pro transition process, it does not help that Taiwan, in, within the Taiwanese government, the governance structure is rather fragmented on the topic of climate change. So on this slide, you can see many ministries uh, have certain authorities in taking climate actions. For example, the EPA, the Huan Bao Shu has been take, leading the role to, to make legislations. The Ministry of Economic Affairs, they are in charge of industrial policies and certain subsidies. And agricultures, uh, the Council of Agricultures uh, manage the emissions around agriculture. The Ministry of Transportation are in charge of the infrastructure, uh, such as public transportation. Many scholars have criticized there has been lack of coordination between these ministries. And unlike some other countries have a sort of central, more competent authorities overseeing the effort. So far in Taiwan's government, we have been seeing uh, very unorganized efforts and some ministry are more pro proactive than others. Be as people have noticed this situation in the recent di policy discussion to reform the Greenhouse Gas Reduction and Management Act, there has been a lot of discussion that Taiwan should put climate change at a more prominent space within the executive UN. Okay, so that's a section for the national politics. You can see that democracy, social movement, and developmental states. And these are some key words to understand Taiwan's action on climate change. Finally, I'm moving on to the section on the local. And it is, Taiwan is a young democracy. It's thriving civil society also facilitate many of the local responses. Here I'm highlighting a few key points. First, uh, there we have been seeing a rising awareness of air pollution in Taiwan. Second, uh, with uh, uh, new democracy, we have been seeing new forms of environmental governance, as well as the burgeoning youth climate movement. And we have also been seeing the rise of some new conflicts in energy transition. Okay. So on air pollution, uh, air pollution has been one of the key issues in the past elections in 2020 and 2018. And to the extent that has been, uh, air pollution has not received so much attention in Taiwan's political history. And air pollution, although it does not connect directly to climate change, but some of the effort can be combined. And some of, we have, we have been seeing people pay more attention to environmental issues in general because people care about the dirty air they have been breathing, especially in central and southern Taiwan. And with the rising awareness, we have been seeing some new initiatives around the country uh, that is a new arrangement of how public citizens and social movement can work together. For example, on this slide, I'm showing you a new effort by a, a citizen science project. The citizens, they mobilize and install air monitors uh, in their homes or in their communities and track the air pollution 
with these sensors. And after they gather data, they can even pressure the local government to take actions to limit some of the emission sources. This is a proof that with a deepening democracy, civil society can also play a key role in governing environmental issues. So this Kongqi Hertz initiative, air or known as Airbox, is more on the is more on air pollution. But on the energy and climate front, we have also been seeing efforts such as uh, community energy, or known as Gongming Dianchang, where citizens they come together to develop a green energy project together. Uh, in this picture, we are seeing a new startup company called Sunny Founder, Yangguang Futejia. They are a startup by one of my colleagues in NTU Sociology. And their work is try to match potential investors within the communities and in install uh, solar panels in local communities. And their, in their work, they are special they especially focus on some of the marginalized or uh, disadvantaged communities and trying to see energy, trying to use green energy as a capacity, capacity building project in many of these more remote places. This is just one example. The, the citizen energy project has been span, uh, spread in many parts of Taiwan and people are taking uh, these initiatives happily to participate in the uh, pursuit of renewables. And in addition, uh, when talking about the local actions, it is important to note that Taiwan's, the young people in Taiwan is also taking on the street. This is a photo I've taken in Taiwan's uh, climate March last October. It was a rainy day, and even within the heavy rain, about 1,000 people showed up in the climate march and demanding the government to take more ambitious action on climate change. Here, I want to make a note that climate change has not been on the main agenda in most of the domestic uh, environmental groups. Environmental groups has been, has been paying attention, they understand the situation, but they tend to focus on more of the, some of the local issues. And because of the international status, we have been also seeing an absence of international environmental NGOs in Taiwan. So these young people in the photo, are some of the most vocal uh, campaigners or more vo most vocal activists uh, to demand for climate action. And finally, I'm showing you a series of reportings that has been sparked uh, wide controversies in recent months. Because of the energy transition, we, there have been an increase of solar energy and wind energy around Taiwan. And we, and we have been seeing a new form of what I call a green-green conflict. Many of the green energy uh, can, can be damaging or can, if not done well, can also disrupt local communities. And we have been seeing this tension uh, between energy development, between the indigenous communities, between the, the recent debate on algae reef, on local ecology, animal habitat, or even on the livelihood of local farmers and fishermen. Taiwan is only on the start of the energy transition process. And in the in the few uh, the coming decades, we will see a much more ma if the, we go with the current plan, we'll see a massive scale of renewable deployment. So, um, 
So I expect to see such conf. This is a learning process. I expect to see such conflict. We will will continue, and this also offer us a great op learning opportunity on how we can manage and can do this project in the most socially equitable way and most ecological friendly way through a democratic process. And I think Taiwanese people are still learning、uh, how to do this well. So that is that is not that is my take on the on the local dimension. So it's also about roughly forty minutes. So I'm going to conclude here. And in sum, I'm today in today's talk. I have been I have shown you the Taiwan's energy emission trend. It has been plateaued, but the reduction path. It's difficult given Taiwan's、uh, emission structure, and there's a lot of effort to be made. I have also talked about the global, the national, and local, and I hope this content give you a general orientation on some of the key issues and some of the key debates in Taiwan's energy and climate realm. And finally, although today's topic is hosted in the Taiwan Studies. Uh, lecture theories. I I also want to highlight that Taiwan is not dealing with climate change in isolation. Taiwan's climate action can also be put into comparative perspectives and shed much much light on how we can do、uh, to the global effort on dealing with climate change. For example, Taiwan as a young democracy, and we can. Do energy transition in democratic way, and this contribute to the debate on、uh, authoritarian environmentalism on how much、uh, climate actions、uh, are in conflict with democracy or not. Taiwan, as I said, Taiwan is a case of developmental state, and our experience on making a greener path can also be instrumental、uh, for. Uh, instructive for other countries. Taiwan's role as a global technology hub is also, is also、uh, critical in the global supply chain and how we can、uh, make an effort together. And finally, Taiwan's geography as an island that is prone to natural disasters can offer another window for other island countries to learn from climate adaptation. So all in all, I hope today's talk give you some interesting insights, and I look forward to our、uh, question and discussion sections. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for this wonderful talk. That、like、really gives us a very nice overview and analysis of key issues around energy. On the local scale, national scale, and also the global scale. So, audience, you can comment using the comment function to type your questions, and John will take a few questions for the Q and A session. So, John, would you like to pick the question yourself, or I can pick the question for you? Ah,、uh, I'm just reading through the comment section because I couldn't see them during my talk. Ah,、uh, let me see. The question is: As Taiwan aims to transition to renewable energy, one popular counterargument is that energy bill will rise dramatically. And would you say this is a reasonable concern? This is a fantastic question. The energy energy price and oil price, to me, is too low in Taiwan. And as I have shown you in the presentation, Taiwan has some of the world's lowest electricity price as well as oil price. And that is in the background. Taiwan does not produce oil or fossil fuels domestically. But that has been a very thorny issue politically, right? So in I think back in、uh, almost ten years ago, or more than ten years ago. 
under the Ma Ying-jeou administration, there was an effort to to normalize or to to put uh, to increase both the electricity price and oil price, and it has been pushed back heavily by the DPP back then, the opposition party, as well by many citizen groups. So I, I think almost politically, it's it's a dead end to uh, to deal with that. But I don't. But in theory, I think that should be part of the reform package, right? And we are the the current low electricity price does not reflect the environmental cost on the, the we, we do not pay for the environmental cost uh, in the use of the energy. And according to some many modelings, the I think that the increase in in, price, in the energy bill is limited. And there is also ways to, you can create a different kind of a stepwise uh, price structure so that we can, we can take care of some of the basic energy need of the low income group while making the, the people, the heavy users of energy pay for its, uh, its, its uh, uh, pay for its price. So that's another question. Let me find some others. New comments. Let me take a question from Ryan, uh, or this is a comment. Do you think it will be wise to eliminate those strategic industries, lose all the jobs, petrochemicals, and steel cement? Okay, so this is an important one. So I think in the energy tr transition plans, uh, I think no one proposed to eliminate steel, cement, and petrochemical companies. These, when I say these are hard to abase sectors, that means it's more difficult for these industries to reduce their emissions. But globally, there has been a lot of effort for, for, for example, the steel industry has been making innovations. How can they, how can, how to produce steels with low carbon sources? The, so in other words, it's it's possible to keep the steel industry uh, alive while doing the while do, also doing low carbon transition. But it, that is a concerted effort that this company has to to make. Uh, otherwise, they will when there has been a lot of effort uh, discussion on how Taiwan potentially can face certain forms of carbon tariff. For example, these petrochemical companies, steel company, if when they want to export their product, and if they have their product come from a high carbon content, when they export this product, they will also face certain uh, tariff uh, so that European steel makers, when they use more uh, low carbon production method, they, they, they are on equal footings. So for Taiwanese companies, it is of their own interest to join the low carbon trend so that they can uh, stay uh, competitive in on the global stage. And so far, I know that China still is aware of the situation. They are sending delegates to, to, to join meetings. But I, I think Given Taiwan's overall isolation uh, situation, their their effort uh, we can increase a lot of effort on on all of these uh, these sectors. And so basically, uh, um, so in this energy transition future, we are not advocating people are not advocating for el elimination of all these industries, but rather we need to decrease the uh, carbon content in all of these areas. Let me see. Okay, I'm answering another question on, given how much energy comes from fossil fuels, is it feasible that renewable can eventually replace all or most of energy given how efficient 
renewable energy is? Yes, the answer is yes. There has been many predictions that the renewable technology, even in the current form, is enough to power, uh, power the world, not only power Taiwan, it is enough to power the world. And on this, give, this is not a Taiwan study subject, but I can, I, I, if you're interested, you can look at Professor Jacobson at, Stan, Professor Jacobson at Stanford. He is one of the leading experts on making these uh, scenarios on how uh, renewable energy is enough to power the world. Let me. I also found a question in the earlier time. Do I feel that newer nuclear power technology should be considered given the carbon emission target? This is a thrown question. <laughs> I think any research on this front. Uh, as a researcher, my, researcher myself, I think it's uh, it should be considered. But my take on energy, nuclear power, I, I often like to emphasize the economic case. Nuclear power uh, does not have much price advantage. It is a power that if you look at the long-term trend, while all the renewable has dramatically become much cheaper over the last decades, nuclear power, the price for nuclear power basically stagnates or even increase a little bit because of the safety concern. So to my view, uh, nuclear power overall, it's a, it's a technology of the past. Does it have any role in the process? Uh, Yes, maybe a little bit, but I don't think it should be at the at the center of the discussion, given given the constraint it has, and even economically, it is not the most uh, most reasonable energy choice either. Okay, so I think are there one last new question. Any potential to develop geothermal like Iceland? Yes, I think so. Uh, so far, Taiwan has been lagging behind on the geothermal developments. Just, we don't need to look so far to Iceland. Just nearby country like Philippines, they have been take they have been developing quite rap rapidly on geothermal energies. So I think that's a potential area Taiwan potentially could work with Philippines uh, on such technology and. Obviously, I think for energy transition, we need all of these sources uh, to decarbonize, to get rid of fossil fuels uh, in the process. Okay, so Dr. Wang, are we almost out of time? Oh, thank you so much, John, for this great like, first lecture to kick off our lecture series. We get so much information about the energy issues, which will be really good information for the future lectures that's coming up. So, process. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation and thanks for participation, everyone. <laughs>